Yo, 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 yo. What's up, all you burner stoners and potheads out there? This is Weedman420 with the Weedman420 Chronicles. How are all you vipers doing out there? Mrs. Weedman. Mr. Weedman. How the hell are you? Fantastic. I love it when you're fan fantastic. Yeah, that too. <laughs> hey, everybody out there in the world. Hope you're doing great. Hopefully, you're smoking some big fat doinks while you're listening to the show. Mrs. Wee Man, we gotta smoke. We need to smoke. We haven't, yeah. I haven't smoked since this morning, so I need to smoke. I wanna get some, I wanna get high, high, high on some Miami Punch. And this is by Revolution Cannabis. You got that bowl over there, Mrs. Wee Man. Go smoke? ahead and, yeah, smoke. Uh, and this is a uh, hybrid, sativa hybrid. It's a cross between Florida orange and purple punch. It does smell like orange. And I think we've smoked this on the show before. I, think I, we did. I had some, I have so much left from the cannabis cup. We're gonna be smoking all these for a while. So until we're done with all these nugs. Uh, total cannabinoids is 21.8.4%. The terpenes are limonene, beta carophylline, beta myrcene, gual, alpha humulene. Uh, it's energizing, elevated, little euphoric. <coughs> but we did smoke it on the show prior. I know we that. Did. Yeah, we did. But smoking it again, like I said, I'm not buying any weed for a minute because I still got tons. So, But it does taste good. It does taste like orange. So... Nice. <coughs> yeah. Good to go? Yeah, I'm ready. That's what I'm talking about. <sighs> oh, that was a fucking big hit. <laughs> <coughs> yep. Uh, as we used, a good thing we used uh, the nice uh, beeswax hemp instead of uh, a lighter. Whew, wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That was a ripper. Um, what's going on in the world? Yuki, again... This poor dog. Oh, my goodness. We had to take her for a <laughs> test today. Two hours she had to stay at the vet's office to do a test. And it is, you probably can explain it better than me, Ms. Wee Man. All I know is that if the test comes back positive, she has a hormone deficiency, Which if I understand lead. correctly. And that could lead to Addison's disease. Yeah, and it could right? lead to, I think, some, some organ failure or... Organs that don't function we don't quite right without a medication, right? So, so, but it sounds like it, like you know, like, uh, like blood pressure. You know, you you your yeah, body you, needs a medication, but as long as you take it, you're good. She'll be good. Be yeah, good. she has. They found out she had low cortisol, cortisol, which was like under one percent, which is could be hurting her digestion. Why she's not. While she's not taking in all the nutrients she needs, she gained two pounds though, which is great. I, had a I think people, she's going to be fine. Honestly. I'm 100 percent think she's going to be fine. She gained two pounds, which is great. We got her on a bland diet, so her, so her her bowels have been great, which is awesome. So, but today was the last test to find out if there's anything else going wrong. And what was funny about this though, she is a weird dog. Yeah. I love her. Oh my god, she's the, uh, she's besides you and the kids, she's my my apple of my eye. You know, right now she's the baby of the family. So, and. We got we. She likes going to the vet. She runs to the door, <laughs> and she runs right to the desk and and like pounces, pounces on up it. with her two paws, looking over because she now reach over the desk and and looks at the, the 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 women behind the desk and just starts like howling at them. Really? Not like barking, like how like talking to him, like come and pet me, show me <laughs> loves. Like, oh, 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 do they oh, give oh, her oh. treats or something? Is that why? No, but every time they see her though, they always say how pretty she is and how good oh. she looks. So and and they some of them come out from behind the desk and one her. time they let me bring her behind the desk and they pet her. So I'm they take her away because it's a two hour test. So they they let me go home. But before I left, there was nobody at the, the the front desk, and I guess they were having a little powwow, the or early morning meeting, and I was waiting just to see if I had to sign any paperwork or anything before I left. So they next, you know, I hear Yuki howling, not barking, not whimpering, talking like she talks yeah. to us, literally oh, talking. Roar, 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 roar. Two of that. two of the ladies, <laughs> so two cute. of the women, the desk workers come out and said to me, I said, is she okay? They're like. Oh yeah, we had our five, our little five minute morning powwow, and she was literally talking to us, <laughs> like telling us like her life story. And I said, I thought I heard her howling, not barking. Yeah, she goes, she's fine, she's loving she's it fine. back there. She got peanut butter and treating everyone's pen. Then our niece texts us, she's a vet tech, there. vet tech there, and says everybody loves Yuki because all she's doing is giving kisses and hugs. Oh, she's so sweet, so sweet. You've got a perfect dog. You I don't know if she's perfect, but she's perfect to me. <laughs> Poor thing has had so many problems. But okay, we're I getting on track. Right? I don't go to the doctor at all. This this dog has gone and seen the vet more than I think I've seen the doctor my whole entire life. And I I was thinking about it, like if somebody was like, oh, you don't know how to take care of your dog. 
I think if anybody really saw how you take care of this dog, they'd probably be <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The dog is taken care of. <laughs> She's very well cared for. Very well cared for. I, I, last night I felt really bad too. Remember I was stoned and I kept on thinking, is it my fault this happened? Oh my God. Is all this He's stuff. He's so dramatic. Is all, <laughs> is all this my fault? So dramatic. I, well, I'm not being dramatic. I've I just told feel you bad. Like 500 times. But it's not your fault, Mr. Weed Man. <laughs> I just feel bad. <laughs> She's got to go through all this. She's a puppy. She's got to go through all this stuff. She's got some things going on. <laughs> I feel bad. She's my Yuki. She's going to be That's my baby dog. <laughs> that is my baby dog. <laughs> oh, smokes. We're coming down to the final episode of the Junior Great British Breaking Show. Yeah, it's so cute. So cute, this one. Oh my God. I, I was thinking about it last night. So there were a first group of eight kids. And then four got eliminated. So when they got to the fin- those bottom four, then they started with a whole new eight. And yeah, which t- is kind of cool. This. Yeah, so then they're going to get down to a final four of those. The two sets of four will mm. then compete. Yeah. And I have to say, like, these kids range in age, which is really a big difference. When you put a 10-year-old competing with a 15-year-old, yeah. that's night and day. Yeah. I mean, 10-year-old to be on that show is, is crazy. A 15-year-old on that show. I like these. I like the Junior Bake Off. But they're so cool. These kids are just so freaking so cool. So cool. They're so calm. So calm. And supportive. And, and helping each other. But also little Weisenheimers. Like, yeah, the comedian yeah, they yeah. have on here is great. And uh, and uh, it's not the normal Paul and uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, Prue. Prue. It's not them. It's Liam and uh, e- Elam. Elam and Liam, or Liam and I forgot. Liam her name. and uh, anyway, Rev. they're great. Rev. 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 I can't. Yeah, Rev. Rev. Ravinia. Rev. I. I can't remember. Anyway, and then they're great. Yeah. They're fun. They're different than the, the Paul and Prue. I like them a lot. And then a different comedian guy. One guy this time, and he is so funny. He He's so good with the kids, and the kids give it back to him. And I don't know if it's planned out or just 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 how it works. It's been this. This been we laughed. I've laughed a lot at yeah. this season. Compared to watching the stressfulness go on with some of the the, the adult bakers, the kids have been freaking great to watch. Well, and it's I just fun. don't understand how these kids do that under the the pressure. <laughs> Amazing, and it's like ours, they're baking, they're on yeah. their feet, they're no one's helping them. They're doing these pretty complex recipes, and they like they're not flustered. Not they're at like all. I got this. They're killing. I got this. It. Killing like, it. They might get discouraged because they screw something up, or they forget an ingredient, or they're they over you know, beat their dough and now it's flat, like right. things like that. Yep. But they don't get discouraged in themselves. Yeah. No, oh, they're good. So cool. It's so cool. Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. I also want to thank everybody for listening to the new uh, the new segment of the podcast, The Grow Hour with me and Big Girl. I know we had a little difficulty on, uh, I'm trying to fix the sound from the last episode. Thank you for reaching out everybody who's told us, yes, we know. Hey, it's new growing pains. And this is why I don't do interviews on Skype or Zoom or any of it because of this reason. I'm not good at tectronics, I guess you want to call it, or electronics or whatever. <laughs> I'm, I, <laughs> I'm just saying this is why I don't – I like people coming to the studio, to the basement sesh, and do it live here. It's easier. It's it's I get better sound quality than doing it over the computer. So this is growing pains, but I do appreciate everyone reaching out to us, letting us know. We know. We're working on it. It'll be growing pains. We apologize. I will if you can put it on YouTube and watch the closed caption. Yeah. Um, you know what I was thinking. You'll be able to. You'll be able to at least read. I know it sucks, but at least watch that. Try to put it on closed caption and do it. So um, I do apologize. We're getting better, and I actually really enjoyed the show. It was our second show, just Wes and I, uh, Big Earl and I, and um, it was really cool. We went an hour and a half hmm. on that second episode, so that was that was big. For us, like not like we've practiced and we talk and we we talk once a week and I mean we're we're DMing and, and phoning all, all the time, but to be able to do an hour and a half show with someone you've only done four shows with and he's been a guest twice and then we did the intro show and this show that's pretty that's pretty long. You just have good natural flow. Yeah, we have good flow. It was kind of good. So, uh, yeah, it was nice. I, I really I really enjoyed that show too. So hopefully everybody out there in the world is enjoying it. You're learning. And this is what it's going to be about because I'm learning from a really good grower and it's going to go for even further. We're going to have a lot of good stuff coming up on it and also big time uh, we have some guests on and, and get better at making sure we have guests on too and make sure we have better sound and stuff. So, But I appreciate everybody out there reaching out to us and I thank you all. So, Ms. Weeman, you want to say something? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say something, but I forgot. <laughs> I would say something. The, but, that that 
It's not a hoodie you're wearing. Uh-huh. You've been wearing it for a couple of days now. It's your, it's your cold. I'm cold. Yeah, like a little house coat. It's pretty fucking badass. Yeah, I know. I really like it. I, every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, you look so cute. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's actually pretty cool. It's like a, a blouse, but it's like sweatshirt material. And no, it it's pretty snaps cool. snaps instead of buttons. I really like it. It's and nice. It's just cozy. Yeah, it, it looks good on you. Thanks. You ready to start the show? Yeah. Let's get to it. Okay. Making the switch. Will THC-infused drinks eventually replace alcohol drinks for most people? All right. Since probably late spring, early spring, there's been a lot of talk on cannabis drinks and, and how they're going to take over alcohol. Now they're going to take over this and how it is the new wave. I've heard this so many times with drinks. and it, it, It's going to be cool. But don't forget, cannabis-infused drinks have been out for a while. Uh, in California, they've been out for a whole b- bunch. You see them here in certain states now. There's a couple that make them. It's not. It's. I like them. They have their place. They don't get me that high, but I do like it because you can drink a bunch of them. I said if you don't want to drink beer, get a bunch of two milligrams, two and a half milligrams. You can drink four or five and mix them with cocktails. What make mocktails out of them? They're they're a lot of fun. Do I think they're gonna take over the can? They're gonna take over the cannabis world. Oh God, no! And they're gonna take over flour and and other edibles and concentrates and 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 all that. No, I think it's gonna be big business. More like a novelty. I think if once it goes federally legal and you could sell it at a grocery store and all sure. that kind of stuff, but CBD ha- drinks haven't taken over the world. You know, they a lot of people drink them, but they don't. They, I don't. I mean, uh, I, I think they could have. A, well, you're talking about alcoholic drinks, or are you just no? I'm talking about any, CBD. Just, no, I'm just, just talking about CBD. THC. Dr- yeah, THC. I think if CBD. THC once it goes federally legal, you start selling it to in in, in convenience stores and all that I think kind of stuff. Will incorporate it into their microdose. I think it's going to be a good business. I think it's yeah. going to be it's going to be big business. I think if once it gets into the beer distributors or liquor distributors' hand, bigger and bigger. Yeah. Yes, and you can get placements. Yes, I will think it will never take over beer sales no. or alcohol sales. Uh, uh, I just don't think it will. I think it'll be pretty big. It could be a $100 billion a year worldwide business if it grows into that way. But from infused wines, beer, seltzer, sparkling waters, and premixed cocktails, the choices are fascinating and interesting to say the least. Manufacturers have determined how to infuse beverages the right way, providing consumers with tasty beverages that may very well be able to replace alcohol. They taste just as good, sometimes even better, and they get you high or at the very least, relax you. Something interesting I just read too, because I, I used to be in the beer industry. Seltzers was the rave from like 2019 to, to probably until last year. You know what uh, took over seltzer sales just now in Q3, going into Q2, in Q2 the summer? Ready to make drinks, cocktails, RDCs. Hmm. Ready drink cocktails. The, uh, the all like yes, the it mix, looks like the a pre-made. little. It's a can. Looks like a bottle of liquor, but it's a drink. It's, oh, it's a, a mixed can. drink. Yeah, it's a yeah, mixed drink in a can. Yeah. They took over seltzers this year oh. over the summer. Hmm. They beat them. It's interesting because I've looked. at I don't those. like seltzers, but I looked at those though a number of times, and you're not going to get your you know your top shelf liquor, and you're not going to get your top shelf mixers. No, it, they're convenience, right? And some of them might be made with nicer ingredients, but yeah. they're not going to be your top shelf liquor. They're probably call mm-hmm. most of them, but yeah. they, I mean, they still sell. People like yeah. them because you could just throw it over ice and drink it, or keep Convenient. it in the can and drink it. And people like a lot of people don't like beer, don't like seltzers. I mean, I, I did one seltzer I drank. I'm not going to throw them a plug or nothing, but there's one out there I do drink at occasion. But that's really about it. I'd rather have hard teas and and um, uh, beer. Beer, yeah, just give me a good, give me a good pilsner. <laughs> nice bourbon. Yep. According to the expert, the cannabis-infused drink market could be valued at $2.8 billion each year from uh, 2025 onwards. However, many think these estimates are actually conservative since the, uh, it's still federally legal, but could change drastically once the tide changes. Like I said, yes. I think it could be a $100 billion industry globally. I don't think it's just in the United States. I think it would be like a $20 billion industry. I just don't think it's going to take over flour. That's just my 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 opinion. Mm-hmm. You know, um, So we'll see. It's going to be very interesting. There's so many companies uh, coming out with – infused cannabis drinks now more so than ever uh i'm reading so many companies i mean i'm not throwing any of them a plug uh but there's a lot out there already there's going to be more and the big boys are getting into it uh, as you know constellation um uh sam adams did is doing one and, and there's so many I, it's just gonna go crazy it's just <laughs> get ready i've had people reach out to me asking me about cannabis infused drinks and what do i know about them and uh do I would I know how to get one get one up and running and started? So 
if you got people reaching out to Mr. Weed Man, you know there's going to be some money to be made in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so just say that. Imagine seeing Mr. Weed Man's face on one. Uh, on a can. Of, on a can. <laughs> <laughs> in my mask. That'd be kind of oh funny. Um, Reefer Madness. Can you believe it's? we're still talking about Reefer Madness? No. It's I had nuts. to throw this article to you. Because yeah. I, knew, I just... I mean, I have Reefer Madness posters all over the, all over the, the the studio. So, I mean, it's just crazy though. We're still talking about it to this day, and the government just and people just blaming it on the mass shootings on weed. It's just, uh, bah. Yeah. So this is another uh, heavy hitter from High Times Magazine. Uh, just say no to the new Reefer Madness. How did we get to a place where pundits are comfortable blaming mass shootings on weed? There's a new wave of anti-cannabis sentiment going around in America. It's scaring the living shit out of me, and it should be scaring you too. I've been paying attention to major newspapers and local or cable news networks over the past few months. I'm sure you've noticed it. Every week there is a new story or segment that proposes a connection between cannabis and psychosis, violent crime, hospitalizations, and more. The underlying data is either anecdotal heavily stretched to fit a narrative, old, or all of the above, and the stories rarely offer context about the tens of millions of cannabis users in the country. But these stories keep on popping up, and now they're gaining traction. How did we go from a decade-plus of incredibly successful state-specific legalization initiatives, billion-dollar taxed and regulated industries emerging from the shadows, and a reduction of the plant's stigma to a situation where pundits are comfortable blaming mass shootings on weed. This new millennium era era of reefer madness first hit the mainstream in 2019 with the book Tell Your Children the Truth About Marijuana, Mental Illness, and Violence by Alex Berenson. A one-time journalist who was temporarily banned from Twitter for spreading COVID-19 misinformation. Full of misleading statistics and anecdotes about wacky tobacco turning regular Americans into crazed killers, Berenson paints cannabis as a social plague unraveling the nation's social fabric one hit at a time. At the time of its release, Tell Your Children received a long and validating review in The New Yorker by popular author Malcolm Gladwell, titled, Is Marijuana as Safe as We Think? That framing is important. Berenson's book is clear about his own personal feelings, that marijuana causes psychosis, psychosis causes violence. The obvious implication is that marijuana causes violence. But... Gladwell posed his review as a question. Gladwell isn't sure if Berenson's hypothesis is right, but he finds the question compelling enough to repeat from his giant megaphone, even though critical readers found plenty of good reason not to do the same. Thankfully, Berenson's book was largely panned by critics as an exercise in cherry-picking data and presenting correlation as causation. But a few years later, it seems, Gladwell's naive repetition was just as influential. In late June, the New York Times published an article titled Psychosis, Addiction, Chronic Vomiting. A weed becomes more potent. Teens, as weed becomes more potent, teens are getting sick. Like Berenson's work before it and Gladwell's review, The story questions the success of the cannabis legalization movement and, relying heavily on anecdotal evidence about struggling teenagers using cannabis and selective data to fit that narrative, that high-powered weed products developed in the post-legalization landscape are dangerous and corrupting your kids. It begs the same big question once again. What if weed is more dangerous than we thought? What the article doesn't note, of course, is that some of these questions already have answers. For example, there is no mention of the centuries of global hashish consumption. Concentrated cannabis is anything but new. Or the fact that unregulated vape cartridges that teenagers typically have access to, described as maligned in their stories' anecdotes, routinely test with THC content closer to 40% and not the 90-plus percent as the story suggests. In asking you to consider whether or not weed is dangerous, the Times article also misses the tens of millions of Americans, adults, and yes, teenagers, who use cannabis daily without issue, and dare I say even, some benefits. 
The Times story also does not mention that it most frequently cited study clearly states a lack of comprehensive research on the subject and readily admits that studies on this topic define high-potency cannabis as products with 10% or more THC. There are no published studies investigating the association between products available in the U.S. legal market at 60 to 90% THC and the onset of first episode psychosis or an increase of symptoms in those who have a psychotic disorder. In other words, there is no data about this, about the specific questions being asked about this supposedly new high potency cannabis, psychosis, and violence, and there will never be answers without more research. Research that is not possible if cannabis is still restricted to a Schedule One status by the federal government. But in the face of far more positive research and anecdotal evidence about pot than negative, why are these stories, studies, and pundits making conclusive statements about the dangers of new weed if the data doesn't even exist? Like Gladwell's book review in 2019, the recent New York Times story did include mon- minor caveats about the need for more research and one pro cannabis viewpoint, but this time the headline question has quickly found its way to the right-wing outrage cycle, where, in the wake of mass shootings in Uvalde, Texas, and again on the in, on July 4th in Highland Park, Illinois, Fox News host Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingren ranted about a connection between cannabis use and at least four mass shootings, drawing a direct casual connection without any supporting evidence. These tactics are not new or isolated to cannabis. Across the country, you can watch people make foundationless leaps and adopt the language of attitude and attitudes of extremists under the guise of supposedly well-meaning inquiries. It's scary how quickly lies take hold and turn fringe ideas into legislation, and to think that cannabis is, is exempt from those forces, or that weed won't be used as a tool to further persecute minority groups is a ahistorical and naive. Look no further than the tragic situation of WNBA superstar Brittany Griner. Despite obvious political motivations behind her arrest and sentencing in Russia, and even with the U.S. government clear about her status as a wrongfully detained prisoner, America's right wing has sided with Putin. From Twitter trolls to cable news pundits and even the 45th president, the right-wing narrative is to blame Griner for her arrest, painting the never-proven allegations of process of possessing two half-gram vape, vape cartridges as a personal moral failure deserving of outlandish punishment. In a radio interview, Trump passionately blamed Griner for her imprisonment, asserting that she was loaded up with drugs in the same week that he praised the idea of swiftly executing drug dealers. In a country where cannabis is still illegal at the federal level and research remains heavily restricted, using stories about depressed teenagers who happen to have vape cart habits to drum up fears about super weed altering the brain of the nation's youth won't inspire research or lead to nuanced conversations about THC percentages in legal products. It will simply further criminalization. As we saw in the first 85 years of prohibition, fear mongering cannabis. It punishes them for it. And with the majority of U.S. public schools now keeping at least one police officer on campus at all times and America still being, well, America, heightened enforcement of youth cannabis use will no doubt mean further criminalization of black and brown teenagers. Despite progress made by state-specific legalization, cannabis-induced psychosis and violence rhetoric is already influencing politicians. Laughed out of the room just a few years ago, Alex Berenson is now back riding the bolstered wave of reefer madness and was recently called as a witness before the United States Senate during the legislature's hearing on federal cannabis legalization during which he cited the recent Times article as a direct example of the changing attitude toward anti-cannabis sentiments, using anecdotes from that specific story to lobby legislators against federal cannabis legalization. So this guy had no facts, just boof. Crazy. Yeah. So this just goes on and on. This is a pretty long-winded one, though. Um, We'll post it. Yeah, we'll post the link to it. And... uh, 
basically, it's it's just demonstrating that there's no research that really validates no. or gives any weight to this whole reefer it's madness. Right. It's just old. It's stupid. Mm-hmm. And just get trying over to take it. one out of yeah. Harry Aslinger's uh, book right there. You know, yeah. fear. Fear mm-hmm. is what drives people to do. Yep. I always wondered how much weed, cannabis, it would take to make concentrates, and I know you need a lot. But I found an article I thought was kind of cool. And cannabis businesses, you know, concentrates are, are, are a big thing, especially with veteran cannabis sm- users uh, because of the higher THC concentrates, uh, the way you smoke it, and they just like it, especially f- using it for medication. So I was wondering, how many grams of weed for a gram of wax? It takes a quarter of an ounce, seven grams, to produce one gram of concentrate because of the extraction of specific cannabinoids. Concentrate only consists of about 20% of the flour used. Wow. How much wax can you make with a pound? One pound of cannabis can produce upwards of uh, of 89.6 grams of wax. The math behind it breaks down to 20% ratio. 448 grams is one pound multiplied by 0.20 results as 89.6 grams. How much wax comes from an ounce of weed? Based on previous calculations, it comes down to 5.6 grams. And one pound of cannabis can produce 89.6 grams. We must divide the number by how many ounces can be found in a pound, 16 ounces. Therefore, one ounce of cannabis can make 5.6 grams. That's, I mean... More than I expected. Yeah, but it still takes a lot. That's a lot of weed. After you... A pound of weed, you're only... I mean... 80, I mean, and you're only getting that much. That's not a lot right. for how much weed you need to make. They use you know, the press to do that, right? They use the buds, the big buds, yeah. But they press it. Yeah. Well, it depends. Uh, depends on what they use. I mean, some of it's, you know, some of it's butane. They freeze it. Some of it's fresh frozen. Some of it's made into, some of it's pressed into rosin. Can they it use just the, the bud after extracting all of that for anything? Yes, you can. There's still a little bit. Remember, we read an article way back about how much is left over. It is, is there is a little bit of THC left, and you can use it for edibles. Mm. You could probably grind, you could probably press it again. Yeah, you know, there's things you can do to tincture. it. Uh, yeah, you can make tinctures out of it. Um, you people take those pucks and put them in their bathtubs. You mm. know, if you can buy them. So, um, yeah. So I thought it was kind of interesting. You know, to see to, to always learn about concentrates, even though we don't use them a lot. I still enjoy them when I have mm-hmm. used them. We did smoke. Uh, we I did smoke uh, an infused joint with the. Uh, uh, it was uh, had uh, hash rosin in it, keef flour. And then it was dipped in oil again and keef on the outside again. It was pretty too. <laughs> it was nice. It was strawberry <laughs> cough too. It was absolutely positively delicious. We have one of those left too. Yeah. We have a blueberry one too that we haven't smoked yet. We will. Um, so migraines. I don't yeah. get migraines, but I know a lot of people that do. And there's some good signs that cannabis, and we've talked about cannabis and migraines before, early episode, long time ago, but there's some more research, right? Yep. Nice. Medical cannabis shows promise as a potential migraine treatment. Migraines, severe reoccurring headaches often accompanied by other symptoms, affect more than 1 billion people around the world every year. 1 billion, huh? Yeah. That's a lot. Migraine headaches are also the second leading cause of disability globally. And I've known people who have like have to sit in a dark room. Like and can't come out of the room. They're in there for hours right. and hours. Um, people get nauseous, all sorts of things. Doctors primarily treat migraines with all different types of pain medications, all of which have potential side effects. Past research shows two-thirds of people with severe headaches and migraines sometimes delay or avoid taking prescribed medications due to the side effects and concerns. In a new study, researchers at the University of Arizona say they have found evidence supporting the use of medical cannabis for the treatment of migraines. The scientists say medical cannabis can help lower a person's migraine frequency per month and reduce nausea and vomiting associated with migraine attacks. Every person is a network of pain receptors called cannabinoid receptors, which are part of the overall endocannabinoid system. The majority of these receptors are located in the central nervous system, which includes the brain. Cannabis naturally contains substances called cannabinoids. When a person uses cannabis, the cannabinoids enter the body and attach to your cannabinoid receptors and alter their effect. For a person with a migraine, researchers say this helps to alleviate pain from the migraine. Previous research also shows cannabinoids can help alleviate nausea, a common secondary symptom of migraine, by affecting certain endocannabinoid system receptors. 
According to Dr. Cecilia Rosales, a research team member as well as associate dean and professor at the Mel and Enid Zuckman College of Public Health at the University of Arizona, the objective of this review study was to evaluate how effective and safe medical cannabis is for treating migraines in adults. For the study, Rosales and her team reviewed 12 publications involving almost 2,000 participants, ages 18 and older, in Italy and the United States. Through their review, the researchers found that medical cannabis was around 50% more effective in reducing migraines compared with non-cannabis treatments. They reported that participants who used medical cannabis reduced their number of migraine days after 30 days and also reduced the frequency of migraines per month. Additionally, the researchers found those who used medical cannabis significantly redu- who used medical cannabis significantly reduced migraine associated nausea and vomiting after six months of use. There is promising evidence that medical cannabis can reduce the effects, nausea, vomiting, and the onset and duration of migraines in adults, Dr. Rosales told Medical News Today. Dr. Medhat M- McHell, a pain management specialist and medical director of the non-operative program at the Spine Health Center at Memorial Care Orange Coast Medical Center in Fountain Valley, California. He said he was not surprised by the findings. We know that medical cannabis can be effective in the treatment of migraines, he explained. The study showed that patients who used it showed less monthly migraine days, and it also helped with some acute episodes. That pinpoints that medical cannabis can be used for prevention of migraines and can be used as an abortive measure for acute migraines. Dr. Sherry Yafai, an emergency medicine physician and cannabis specialist at Providence St. John's Health Center in Santa Monica, California, stated she was glad there is more research showing proof of cannabis's effectiveness. Just like in the review study, we're seeing a very similar response in patients that we're treating as well, which is that patients have a shorter duration of their migraine headaches, she explained. Instead of their headache ranging from days to weeks, it lasts just hours, depending on when they intervene with cannabis use. Part two is that oftentimes associated with migraines, we see nausea and vomiting, Yafi continued. Again, we see a decrease or a stop in nausea and vomiting that's associated with it. And then there's the other nice part in treatment that we're seeing very minimal side effects with the treatment of migraines, and they can cut or reduce their other migraine treatments. Yafai also stated that study off, this study offers further support for the endocannabinoid deficiency theory. There's an article that outlines this theory, which finds migraines, fibromyalgia, and irritable bowel syndrome fall into a range of diagnoses that may be linked to our endocannabinoid system as being deficient, she noted. And that may be why a lot of medications up until now have not been working well and why migraines can be very responsive to cannabis-based medications. While this research and previous studies support medical cannabis as a treatment option for migraines, Rosales does point out that there are some potential downsides that require further study. Some of the possible side effects are an increase in heart rate, impaired concentration and memory, dizziness, and slow reaction time, she explained. There can be interactions with other medications, increased appetite, and potential for addiction, among others. McCall pointed out, the current study reported an overoccurrence of medication overuse headaches. In participants who used medical cannabis, um, researchers reported that the adverse events were mostly mild and took place in about 44% of participants using oral cannabinoid preparations. My goal as a headache specialist is that if I want to treat patients for migraines, I use medication that has the least amount of side effects and does not cause another headache on top of the migraine, Mikkel explained. We do not want to use medications on a regular basis that cause medication overuse or rebound headaches because that's a negative side effect that we don't want to see. It becomes very confusing to the patient and to the providers in dealing with symptoms on top of symptoms. And Yafai stated, another current downside to medical cannabis lies in the legalities. She explained that even if people are seeing good results using medical cannabis as a treatment, their job, school, or athletic programs may have rules in place barring its use. 
We're seeing these things pop up more and more where it becomes a question of is it worth it or not. For some people, it most definitely is worth it, and they're willing to run the risk, and for others, not so much. McCall said he would like to see a longer study looking at the potential side effects of medical cannabis. Plus, we don't know what the effect uh, the long-term use of these medications have on the central nervous system and the brain, because there are definitely reported changes in cognition, memory, and some other effects that have long detrimental effects on the brain, he said. Yaffe said that right now most studies regarding medical cannabis as a treatment option are observational, as opposed to the gold standard in medicine, which is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. That's notoriously difficult to do in the world of THC specifically, but we are starting to see new laws and options continue to change every six months to a year, she said. And Rosales said she hopes her study's findings will provide clinicians with additional tools to treat migraines in adults because the federal government continues to restrict the use of medical cannabis as a Schedule One substance under the Controlled Substance Act. Clinicians will hesitate to use it as an alternative medication, she explained. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has the federal authority to approve drugs for medicinal use in the U.S., and as of this year, the FDA has not approved medical cannabis product for clinical use, only cannabis-derived or related products, although many states have legislatively allowed the use of cannabis for medical medicinal purposes. Once it goes on, if the FDA approved some stuff, then doctors could, would start prescribing it more, mm-hmm. you know, not even be scared about it. So. Mm-hmm. More than 100 licenses for medical cannabis dispensaries in 29 Mississippi counties have been issued. Good for Mississippi. It's about time. Uh, Here's something crazy. Since uh, recreational in 2020, Illinois has done $3 billion since market launched, with $1 billion sold so far this year alone. Shoo! That's crazy. (laughs) Uh, Yes, yes, yes on number four. Ballot campaign launches push to legalize cannabis in Maryland. So if you see this, uh, it's an industry-backed campaign to legalize recreational cannabis in Maryland launched Thursday, urging voters to pick yes on four. Yes on four. Yes on four if you're in Maryland. The November ballot questioned about uh, legalizing uh, pot possession for adults 21 and over. If the measure passes, Marylanders, who are the least uh, 21, will be able to legally possess up to 1.5 ounces of cannabis and grow two plants out of public view beginning July 1st of 2023. That's a year away. Yo, Marylanders, you can grow two plants. You can get some weed from two plants. Trust me, I got two plants in the hopper right now going. I'm going to get a few ounces out of that and then start all over again. So, telling you, vote for Maryland. Vote for we Man 420, Mr. and Mrs. Wee Man, we approve for four. Yes, yes, yes. Um, no cap. Nikki, uh, Nikki Fried blast Ron DeSantis' latest medical cannabis restrictions. Uh, yeah, there was a um, – the Florida Department of Health imposed a cap last month on patients restricting them to 24,500 milligrams of THC per 70-day period. Oof. Oh, man, you just want the black market to keep on going in Florida, don't you? That's stupid. I don't even just get on the ballot recreational. Stop treating it like a business, Florida. And it, the government just thinks these licenses are worth fifty billion, fifty million dollars, and stuff like that. You're ridiculous. It's not a business like that. It shouldn't be. The government should make no money off this except for taxes to give back to the communities. So uh, here's some stupid Nevada Supreme Court rules: employers can fire workers for off-duty cannabis consumption. So if you get tested, this is on normal uh, Nevada's normal. Uh, if you get uh, drug tested and you're smoking cannabis only after work, regardless, you, they still can fire you. That's stupid. Don't you guys realize that? Like almost like there's a lot of people in 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 the in the, can, in the industry, uh, the restaurant, bar, nightclub, hotel industry that smoke cannabis a lot after work to relax and come down from those stressful nights. Come on, man, you're gonna lose a lot of workers. Uh, Montana. Cannabis sales break record for August, approach 75% of total market. They did something like $26.8 million in August. That's Montana. Crazy. Uh, President Joe Biden doesn't plan any cannabis moves ahead of midterms, White House suggests. Terrible. And the Democrats are really urging him to do something before November, like like now, to do something, just so it gives them a lean, I guess. I don't know. It's just, he's, whatever. It's just crazy. 
Retailers count down the legalization in Vermont. Vermont has finally been cleared to begin issuing retail cannabis licenses, and locally industry is excited. I'm excited, too. One day, if I ever get to go to Vermont, I'm going to smoke some weed there. Meditation. Um, um, um. I wish I had the little finger bells. Bing, 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 bing. Um, you know the little finger symbols, right? Mm. <laughs> I've got five tips to ensure the perfect high meditation. There we go. Cannabis and meditation are kindred spirits in a way. People use both separately to find a sense of peace, tranquility, and the feeling of being present in the moment. I'm going to meditate right now. Yeah, get to it. Cannabis has also infused itself into many forms of meditation over the years. Weed has spiritual roots in meditation that date back to some of the oldest meditating civilizations. In fact, according to Vice, the Vedas, which were historical texts written in India around 1500 BC, named cannabis as one of the five sacred plants. While meditation and cannabis are connected, it does not mean that when you take a bong rip and close your eyes, you will find your zen. I if, do every time. <laughs> if you're interested in using weed to elevate your meditation, you need to look deeper at meditative practices and how cannabis affects your mind and body. In order to have a successful and meaningful meditative practice with weed, you need to do a bit of planning. But if you do your research and follow these five tips, you should have no problem enhancing your meditation practice with a little help from weed. So one... Take the proper dose. Perhaps the most important guiding principle when combining weed with meditation is taking the right dosage. The amount you need for your meditation depends on exactly how high you think you should be for the practice. Many people like to microdose in order to get some calming effects without being too mentally altered, while others prefer to be completely high when they try to find inner peace. As we have previously reported, there are steps and guides to microdosing, which is 1 to 2.5 milligrams, milligrams of THC, and macrodosing, which is 10 milligrams of THC and higher, and doing it properly. The key is to know your goal and to consume with intent, rather than just popping a random edible and hoping for the best. The proper dosage, planning, combined with the right practice, can greatly improve your desired results. Two. Choose the strain to match your practice. There are all different types of meditation with all different goals. Some meditation is geared toward breathing more consciously, while other meditations help create a pure calm. Just as there are different types of meditation, there are just as many and more strains of cannabis to complement your intention. We previously reported on the 10 best strains of weed for meditation. These include everything from the popular and sedative Northern Lights to the trippy and transfixing Shaman. But keep in mind, this selection may be different depending on your own personal goals. If you're unsure of how you react to different strains, it might be best to start with a well-balanced hybrid with high levels of CBD, since CBD is known to help with calming the mind and body. Three, ensure you are rested and calm before elevating your practice. Meditation is all about setting a tone and being genuine and committed to your time in meditation. It cannot be rushed or faked, and weed will not magically put you in the mood to meditate. Make sure you have done your best to resolve any issues in your day, or at least don't let them linger. Be sure to pause all conversations and tie up loose ends. Our minds tend to wander, and they can be magnified when high. So be sure you've wrapped up your tasks are in, and you are in a calm place so you can give your all to finding your inner peace, at least for a little while. Four, set the mood before you get high. One tip to ensuring a successful and blissful meditation is to set a tranquil mood in your meditation space and to set it up before you get high. It's true that you can meditate anywhere, but it helps to have a tranquil space, especially if you are newer to meditating. Candles or incense, mood lighting, and harmonious sounds are all helpful, but choose what feels right to you. Most importantly, do this before you get high. Otherwise, you may find yourself sidetracked by the process and completely lose focus on the task at hand. Consider creating your meditation space and then getting high in that space to further set the mood and relax you. Five, properly schedule your meditation time. When it comes to your length of your meditation practice, you can meditate for as little as one minute and upwards of several hours. It's best to have a good idea of how long you would like to meditate. This lets you schedule the appropriate amount of time for the entire activity. 
in addition to the meditation time, you need time uh, to consume your cannabis and for the effects to take place. So if you're smoking, you might need to add 15 minutes buffer so you can smoke before um, you start your, your practice. Edibles require more advanced planning, and if you plan to use edibles before meditation, uh, it's a good idea to have a loose window since you're never really quite sure when the edible will kick in. So, pretty cool. I want a meditation space. I think Mr. Weedman, what? he You're was done? in the zone just now. I was meditating. <laughs> yeah, you, I think you were just spacing out. Uh, maybe a little bit of both. Well, no, I was thinking, actually, were because uh, there was two things I forgot to mention before we go to international news. Oklahoma is prosecuting pregnant women for using medical cannabis. I, you know what? I, I get it. There's things that you shouldn't do when you're pregnant, you know, but to arrest somebody for or prosecute them, mm-hmm. that's kind of, and in Alabama, women, pregnant women are being jailed for smoking cannabis right now. Hmm. Two things I read today earlier and I didn't, forget to mention them. Crazy, crazy to yeah. arrest them. Yeah, the whole like weed consumption and pregnancy, I don't, you know. We've read some articles on it. There's, you know, I think it's, it's very situational. You know, I mean, people take opiates for pain while they're pregnant. Doesn't yeah. It doesn't mean it's good. But right. People do it. Right. That's true. They take, uh, people take all sorts of things. Yes. Medications. Yes. That while are not great for their baby or, or their own body, but right. they need them. They need the medication or they abuse whatever, you know? So it, I think that it's situational. It's right. It's not for anyone else to judge. Right? Yes. To or arrest. Or arrest. But yeah, to be arrested. To arrest it or, yeah. or be prosecuted. Give That's just that. Oh, my gosh. What is this coming to? <laughs> this world. My goodness. International news now. Governor of Bermuda update on cannabis licensing bill. Governor statement 6 of September. Bermuda, Bermuda cannabis licensing bill. Uh, previously announced that he had reserved the cannabis licensing bill 2022 for the signification of Her Majesty's pleasure under Section 35 of the Bermuda Constitution. I have now received instructions issued to me on Her Majesty's behalf, not the assent to the bill as drafted. The Secretary of State, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Affairs included the bill as currently drafted as not consent with obligations held by the UK and Bermuda under 1961 single convention of narcotic and the 1971 convention of the psychotropic substance. Uh, note to editors, in terms of cannabis reform, the key international obligations are set out in the United Nations Convention. Uh, the convention permits legalization cannabis and cannabis products for medicinal and scientific purposes and for certain industrial purposes as long as appropriate regulatory oversight is put into place. The legalization of cannabis for other purposes is not permitted under the convention. It is possible to decriminalize the possession of limited amounts of cannabis for personal use. But that is not the same as making the cannabis legal, for example, for sale in the shops and cafes. So just decriminalize and let people grow their own. Simple as that. Simple. It's easy. Just mm-hmm. let people be able to hold up to a pound and that's it. The Secretary of State of Foreign Commonwealth and Development Affairs has concluded that the bill legalizes cannabis for other purposes. Come on, Bermuda. Uh, German cannabis imports growing as Canada leading shares wane. Uh, Germany imported a record amount of cannabis for medical sales and scientific uses in the first half of the year, putting the European Union's biggest market on pace to match possibly surpass the 2021 uh, totals. The data paint a picture of medical marketing that growing consistently do not at blistering pace some analysts had forecasted amid the cannabis stock market mania of 2018 to 2020. Separate data shows Canada's role as the country's top supplier has waned a, co- a competition to supply the prize is still small. German market intensifies. Cannabis companies in Denmark, Netherlands, and Portugal also supply German market. Imports of dried flour and extracts through the first six months of 2022 equaled 10,011.6 uh, tons. Wow! <laughs> which is 6.1% higher than the first half of last year, uh, which were imported uh, 9,800 kilograms were imported according to the data from the Federal Institute of Drugs and Medical Devices. Dried cannabis is accounted for as uh, a weight in kilograms, while extracts weight is calculated as the amount of dried flour used to production of the imported extracts. That's crazy. 11.6 mm-hmm. tons for, for Germany. And that, that's importing that, that in. That's nuts. So Canada's being challenged because they were in b- big importer to them, but they're sl- they're slipping. You're slipping, Canada. Uh, growth is impressive, but not exponential. Business eyeing the German import market are warned against buying into any forecast of exponential growth. The German government data shows that imports dropped meaningfully in the final quarter in three of the past five years. 
While that may sound disappointing to those who are expecting unstoppable exponential growth, it's still impressive to see the market that started with less than two metric tons of imports in 2017 that grew over 20 tons imported by 2021. I mean, I think once it goes federally legal, once it goes legal there, I mean, it's going to be friggin' they're pretty close too. It's going to be pretty big. It's going to be a big market and they're importing like crazy. So, um, nuts. Just they're going to go crazy. That's all I got to say. I want to smoke weed in Germany one day once it goes legal. Glamping. More fancy glamping. camping. Glamping, glamping, glamping. You want Well, this glamping. is actually a B&B, a story about a B&B, and it is a stoner's forest paradise. That's pretty cool. I do want to go glamping. <laughs> I want to go camping, glamping. I want to go glamping. I want fancy camping. <laughs> yeah, a good view. <laughs> All right. Relax and spark up at this friendly cannabis treehouse bed and breakfast in the woods outside of Sultan, Washington. Mountain View Treehouse, Mountain Views Treehouse Bed and Breakfast Retreat. Let's guests do that, literally and figuratively. The Treehouse Getaway offers cannabis-friendly stays on nearly four acres northwest of Sultan. The rural Snohomish, Snohomish County property is nestled among towering cedars, sprawling grass, and a fenced-in area for alpacas, a cat, dogs, a donkey, a horse, goats, and sheep. My partner and I stayed in the smallest option, the hashtag treehouse, on a sunny weekday in June. It was the first treehouse that owner-operator Tracy Rice, 45, had built almost nine years ago. Three others have since joined it, each larger than the last. Guests can smoke and vape weed in any of them, or outside near the campfire, or on a bungee net, or in the kitchen lounge. It started always from day one, as cannabis friendly, Rice said, my dream of staying home stoned in my pajamas with my pets came true. Rice greeted us like she does all of her guests around noon on the day of our stay with a text. Hi, spelled like H I G H. That's how I say hi to everybody. <laughs> hi, <when> spell. <laughs> ben. <laughs> From the tree lined road, the gravel driveway leads to a gate. Rice blocked the entry for after some trespassers she suspects learned about it from a video on TikTok. But her treehouse retreat also has been featured on local news, Forbes magazine, High Times magazine, and the Seattle Met magazine. A sign says, Mountain Views Treehouse, bed and breakfast. But there won't be any bacon, cereal, eggs, or pancakes waiting pancakes waiting inside the main house instead rice said it needs to be bed and bong <laughs> yeah. through the gate the driveway passes the livestock guard dog and his flock of two alpacas two baby doll sheep two fainting goats a horse a donkey and a pig as we pull into the parking space designated for our treehouse rice greeted us with her dog poncho he's one of 15 animals on the property most of which have weed related names love it such as alpacas Bong and Dab, Sheep's Mary Jane and Flower Pot, Guardian Dog Bullseye, and Fainting Goats Homie and Roni, who were named after the Stay Home Order and Coronavirus, respectively. <laughs> she showed us the property and to the hashtag treehouse, maybe 15 feet above the ground. The steps took us to a room with a lofted full-size bed. It was enough space for us to spend the night away from home, share a joint, and giddily laugh the night away. The main level had a chair, a beanbag, and a little table with an ashtray grinder, color-changing LED lights, crystals, and sage. A Grateful Dead poster could have completed the vibe, which Rice said she meticulously curates in the spaces, the property, and among the guests. She's declined reservations from potential customers if she senses they're not really interested in a place that lets people smoke weed almost anywhere. But it doesn't happen often because one constant is true for her guests. All of them are stoners, Rice said. As more states decriminalize and legalize recreational cannabis use, the demographic of who consumes gets broader. National Cannab Cannabis Industry Association Communications Director Bethany Moore said, it's not just the stereotypes from decades ago. Combining lodging and cannabis creates opportunities for people who can't or don't want to use it at home. It's interesting to see the ways that legalization of cannabis is being applied to other industries, Moore said. 
Weed is a big business in Washington. Last fiscal year, recreational cannabis had almost $1.5 in sales. Big. Gen- generating $553 million in excise tax revenue, Shh. according to data from the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board. The Washington Cannabis Association, a trade group, knows that it, its products and work knows that its products and work have created spending in other sectors, too. While we don't have data evaluating the cannabis sector with hospitality in Washington specifically, we expect that the next 10 years in the industry will reveal more and new opportunities and advancements in the science of the cannabis plant, a spokesperson said. And similarly to its excellence in leadership with wine, apples, aerospace, and technology, Washington will be recognized for its contributions in the cannabis industry. Rice got into the bed and breakfast business in Snohomish County after opening and selling a weed store in Colorado. She knows cannabis. For the record, she prefers indica concentrate and flour, but you won't be able to buy any bud from rice. The property also has an a la carte uh, feature menu. Uh, they've got a hot tub, so you just pay per use on certain things. But this suspended bungee cord net that she hangs by the trees sounds really cool. Um, and she said... It's like laying in a giant tree net. She calls it a net flick and chill because hmm. you can get a chill uh, hook up a projector for you so you can lay in the big net and watch movies. Um, once we re- retired to our treehouse space, an owl hooted us to sleep. Birdsong greeted us uh, with a sunrise gleaming through corrugated plastic sheets that made up most of the walls. We could have drawn the curtain for a little more sleep, but that would have hidden the allure of waking up to the sight of cedar bows and trunks, and grass fields below. It was easy to imagine bringing a few other friends to occupy the other tree houses and making a properly silly weekend of it all. Breakfast in the lounge, lunches in the net, dinner around the campfire. Munchies can be satisfied via food delivery apps that can bring goods from restaurants in Monroe and Sultan. It's one reason Rice recommends, but hasn't required, to stay at least two nights. She said, number one, you're going to lose a day here. It just happens. Number two, don't be mad at yourself if you don't do anything that you planned. You're going to get here, and you're not going to want to leave. <laughs> Pretty yeah. cool. The pictures yeah. were awesome. Yeah. So take a look. Pretty neat. Funniest cannabis strains that have come out lately. There's some weird names. There is some weird names out there. Everything I always read, people posting and stuff like that, showing their strains. But some. Uh, what's in the name? It was a time in the days when I was buying weed, and it was just brick weed. That's what you called it. And then you got some cool dro, you got some hydro, stuff like that. I've talked about that before. But why some name strains have funny names? Over the last few decades, strain names have ranged from wacky and whimsical to downright serious and profound. Some of the most sought-after strains got their titles for their revolutionary history. Some have also gotten it from their uh, growers' intent, while some uh, from urban mythology and some from watching South Park. For marketing purposes, cannabis strains have been given memorable and funny names to have a lasting impression on their target audience. Let's say you had a choice between two strains, both of which were unheard of, and you weren't uh, allowed to inspect or research before making the choice. Would you rather select a strain that sounded plain and boring or dull, or one which sounded awesome, exciting, and even downright hilarious, not knowing what was in it? Mm. What are you going to go for? Mm, the you name. Know? Right. <laughs> uh, some funny seed names. Crouching Tiger Hidden Alien. <laughs> it's a pretty good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, blue Balls. It's a cross between blueberries and blue balls. Chem Dog <laughs> and Blueberry, actually, two of my favorite strains. I have to find it and try some Blue Balls. Brown Bomber. Uh, it's seen American comedy flick Grandma's Boy. When you should have no trouble identifying the name Brown Bomber, the strain's ultra potent knockout effects are akin to therapeutic cleaning vibrations. <laughs> Uh, cheesy dick down in the dumps upset about your boss and give you credit for a critical report prepared over the weekend perhaps the little cheesy dick is all you need mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, history is the cheesy and the strain from the uh, from the parent big Buddha cheese strain while the dick comes from the secondary parent Moby dick give it a chance they say I wouldn't smoke it because it's got cheese in it Buh. Charlie Sheen there's no need to squint because the read is right. Charlie Sheen is a strain of cannabis, and we've been giving it to our two and a half thumbs up. Sorry. The strain's hybrid cross between green crack and blue dream. Great. Uh, two great strains. <laughs> and uh, all the winners right there. So Chuck Norris, black and blue dream. Uh, cat piss. 
<laughs> cannabis strain hailing I'd from skip that one. the Pune. I've heard of cat piss before. I heard it's actually pretty good too. And it smells like piss. Indica I was buds. Say like super ammonia. Yeah. Cat piss offers superb quality indica buds, although the overpowering and pungent smell of urine is something that might get taken used to. Uh Alaskan Thunderfuck, I've heard of that one. Mm-hmm. Train wreck, I've smoked that before and heard of it. Schnazzleberry, uh, which takes a little play off of Willy Wonka's snozberries. And then Bob Saget OG. I would like that one. And then Barack Obaba. Mm. All good, funny names. I mean, I wouldn't forget them. You know, if mm-hmm. I smoked them and or I didn't smoke them, I'd probably go for most, except for the cheese one that would turn me away. So, but some funny names. Funny, funny. Funny, funny. Miss Weed Man, you got anything else to say? It's the end of the show. No, let's smoke some more. I'm I'm going to smoke. I'm going to go down, though. I'm going to smoke a downer strain. But this was a downer. <laughs> no, wasn't this it? was a sativa hybrid. It was, I feel really mellow, and I think you are too. Uh, I am a little mellow, but it's fi- it's almost a 50 50. I think it's a 60 40 from what I was reading on here. But it, it, has pur- it has purple punch in there, and purple punch is an indica, you know. Hmm. So, But you um, want even something. More I, mellow than of that. Of course. I always want something more mellow. I want to mm-hmm. go to bed. <laughs> I'll be up watching TV all night. <laughs> we've been we've been uh what we've been working on that thousand milligram uh caramel oh, that I yeah. got when I was in Oklahoma. A chiba chew. Yeah, we were working it's on good. that one. It tastes like a homemade. Yeah, I we've like been it. Little bits and pieces. I ate I think it's a good punch. I ate a big piece last night and I was high for a minute, but then but it's yeah, you know what? It's 100 milligrams per piece of candy, so I, like, sectioned it off with a knife into 10 pieces. And, yeah. Here's the high is good. It don't last very long. No, it doesn't. And I took 20 milligrams last night, and that would normally knock me the hell back, and it didn't. And all of a sudden, it's like we were in bed, and I'm like, okay, it's over. And And here's here's why. Because it's distillate. That's not live resin. That's not rosin. That's not. It's just straight distillate gummies, and our body is not. It, we've been we don't eat a lot of distillate and i don't like a lot of distillate cuz a lot of it just it's it's here today gone tomorrow it's cheaply made you know it's it's fast acting not fast acting but fast onset and then it's all of a sudden it's gone hmm. i I've, I've never you've heard me say it in prior episodes i'm not a fan of distillate i i mean it's in a lot of edibles a lot of edibles use distillate cuz it's cheap you can do it boom you get them out done but as you produce it a lot of just to save money, you got to water some stuff down a little bit and you, you use the proper amount. But at the strength level, I still don't think it's that good. Right. It's 10 milligrams. It's 10 milligrams. I but had the, my little piece two nights ago and it was really effective. I felt like I maybe it was too much. No, nah, not too much. It was good. I was you were high. happy with it. And then last night, I was high, not as high, same amount that I ate. But it was, it, like you said, it was short lived. Yeah. Got in bed and it was just kind of like, oh. Yeah, and I ate 20 milligrams. Gone. Yeah. So I'm, you know, there's certain edibles that I like that out there that are really good. I I like Mrs. Wee Man's edibles. They get me fucked up, and I haven't had a Mrs. Wee Man edible in a hot some. minute. <laughs> Listen to me. I'm nodding. <laughs> Past your bedtime. No, Mrs. I think Wee that Man. that that strain was a that's a calming one for me. For you, man, yeah. The terp. Oh, you know what though? I mean, the terpenes that are in here. I mean, look, they're they're. So you got, carifoline and myrcene. You have. Uh, a little bit of humulene, which we just read about in the last episode, limonene, and you have uh, guala, 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 <laughs> guala, guala. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> you like the guala, the guala, guala, guala. <laughs> I like the guala, guala. <laughs> got the guala, guala. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know, it's a song by G E Z and a couple other guys. I don't remember all the artists on that song, but you like the guala, guala. I like the guala, guala. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even see straight right now. Oh, shit. All right, everybody out there, we're going to end the show before it goes in a different direction. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, everybody, thank you for listening. Peace be with you all out there. We love you all. Thank you so much for everybody always hitting us up and sharing love, and we appreciate you all out there. We appreciate you for listening. As Paulie always says, smoke smart, puff puffing away. Puff puff pass.